I think I always wanted to pursue art. It was, I think it was the only thing that I was ever really good at. You know, when you're like 13, 14, and you have no idea who or what you are, I could very easily put myself in the I'm the art kid box. I got to be like an acceptable outsider. You're weird and bizarre and novel without actually being any different from anyone else. If you wanna make two things that are exactly the same, it starts with weighing. If you put, it's like super close, I don't know I'm putting so much on there. If you put six pounds of clay on the wheel and you use that six pounds the same way every time, you'll end up with the same shape. So if you, know, if you have an extra ounce of clay and you're using all of the clay, it's gonna go somewhere. It's either gonna be in the height or the width or it's gonna be at the bottom and you're just gonna end up trimming it off. So this helps with the serving bowls because they're big and flared. If I make the foot the same size every time and I expand it to the same width every time, it'll be the same height. It was funny, when I first started making these, you know, I would use six pounds and they would be 10 or 11 inches across. And then as I got better at throwing, they started growing and I had to adjust the like listings. So now they're between 13 and 14 inches when they're fired. But these ones like, they, they're supposed to, this is the shape that was giving me trouble before. They're supposed to have this ridge in them on the inside. I feel like it just makes it feel sturdier when you hold it, like this rim is just really delicate. Um, so we're gonna go for this one. Give it a shot. You might see a rare failure, the humanizing moment. I wanted to take more art classes my senior year of high school. Um, and the only one that fit my schedule was uh, the intro to ceramics class. So I spent all of my free time in that class. It always existed as, as like a hobby in my mind, because at that point I was, I was very certain that I was gonna become a comic book illustrator for Marvel. That was the goal. And then I went to school for illustration and like a semester into that program, realized that I'm bad at it. I thought I was really good at it. And then I went to school and saw where everyone else was and who I was gonna be competing with, with these like masterpieces that these 19 year olds were pumping out. So uh, I couldn't stop thinking about ceramics and the priorities shifted. I wanted to keep the illustration as, as the side project, as the personal stuff, and then make ceramics professionally. I talked to a bunch of people in various departments and they were like, you don't have to major in illustration. What you can do is major in something else that you really wanna do and just take a ton of illustration classes. And I like to, you know, draw to relax. And I felt that when I was in illustration, what originally was very relaxing became extremely stressful. I think I was much more comfortable being bad at, at ceramics than I was being bad at illustration because I'd spent so much time as a kid thinking I was really, really good. And it was just a particularly rude awakening. The biggest part of making these bowls is like how they, it's how they start setting the, the like platform for them to grow from. Because if it's too narrow, they'll fall over, but if it's too wide, then they end up kind of low and squat. The biggest struggle in throwing is keeping everything centered so that you can work just on one spot and affect it evenly. Um, and you want that clay to be able to glide underneath your hands, you don't want it to drag. Because if it drags, then it's gonna get pulled out of center. And you wanna be careful how fast you turn the wheel because you know, if it gets too quick, it's gonna pull the bowl apart. But if it's too slow, then you have to move your hands equally as slow to keep everything you know, kind of centered and uniform. All right, so now we're getting into the shaping. And this is where it gets really delicate. Because clay just wants to fall over. Everything wants to be flat. But this is when the wood knife comes in handy. So we're gonna prop this wood knife up underneath. First we like scoop some of this unnecessary clay out of there. 
And then we're gonna get the round side right in that bend and like really gently lower this bowl onto that wood knife. You can see how it's starting to wobble? It's because it's off center. Ah, all right, so there's like a moment when I'm making these where I know if it's gonna work or not. And I can already get a sense that this one's, yeah, it's right here. You can see this like little shoulder that's coming up. I can save it, but I won't like it. Uh -huh. Just watch the rim. See how it's got that Yeah. Can't do it. Drives me crazy. <laughs> Wedge it up and try again. You can't get too attached to it. And it's, it's at a point where, you know, if you're like experimenting with a shape, it pays to keep it and look at it. But if you know what you want to make and it's just not going in the right direction, you need to accept it, learn from it, and then move on. Yeah, I've been struggling to make that shape. I mean, I've made like hundreds of them. And for some reason, I guess it's just been a long time since I've made them, but I, I'm, I need to break it down and like really go through it slowly and figure out where I'm going wrong. And I think what it is, is this is too narrow. I think this needs to be like out here so that it doesn't start to wobble. It's more supported from underneath. Um, but let's give it another shot. Let's see if we can't bring this one home. Now, now I'm in it. We'll do this bowl, it'll happen. I wish that I could consult some like pottery god and, and pray for like divine wisdom in what to do and like to know that I'm on the right track because everyone does it differently and a system that works really well for someone won't work for someone else just depending on the way that, that the work is made. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that has to make the decisions for the studio and um, it's just a lot of pressure. That's my favorite part, doing the tails. How come? It's just a nice big swoopy line. And there's a wide margin for error. I mean, the tail looks like a tail. The human astronauts I never draw in advance because I've been doing these little guys. They've, there's been a human astronaut on just about every piece that I've made for as long as I've been doing this. Which at this point, it's like six or seven years. Uh, I went to see Gravity in theaters in, I don't know, maybe like 2014. So I was doodling astronauts everywhere. And I've always been really into sci-fi. I had the opportunity when I was working for this guy to just like kind of make whatever and, and chase whatever idea I could. He saw the, the doodle of the astronaut and told me that, you know, if I put that on pottery, he would try and sell it for me and we would see if it worked. And then it did. For a very long time, I only did dogs and cats in space because it was the kind of thing where, you know, those are common pets. People love dogs, people love cats. They're, it's just popular. Now I'm working with people who don't like dogs or cats, but have chickens. And, and now that's like, they see more of their interests represented in my work. I'm not doing a photorealistic portrait of their dog, but they see their dog in it. So I try to keep all the proportions like somewhat consistent, consistently inconsistent, I guess. When I first started putting animals into the designs, for the first like year or two, it was just human astronauts. And then when I first started putting animals into the designs, it was largely limited by the materials because I only had black, white, and yellow. Yellow for the visor on the astronauts, black and white for the space and the stars. Uh, so it was limited to what animals or what dog breeds come in, in those colors. So it was a lot of like golden retrievers and huskies and black labs. And I mean, those are like, three like classic dog breeds. The size of the dog has changed dramatically because you know I can put way more detail into this, I can get a more expressive face. But I always keep this one around just to you know see how far the human astronauts haven't they haven't, <laughs> they haven't really changed much at all. But the dogs have changed a ton. I thought this when I did that, I thought that, that was the best thing that I'd ever done. And at the time it probably was. And then I went to one show and got harassed by cat people that I wasn't doing cats to. So I decided to add cats in. Uh, and the first cats that I painted, you know, I sat down and I was like, I know what a cat looks like. I can draw a cat. And I drew all these cats and I went to this show and someone came up to my booth and said, oh my God, I can't believe you have weasels in space. I love weasels. She's like, I have all these weasels. This is amazing. And you know, I was like, yeah, <laughs> of course I have weasels in space. And went home and like looked at pictures. This is before we had cats. And I looked at pictures of cats and I was like, oh yeah, no, I, I missed the mark. Now, you can picture something in your head and see it perfectly 
and it can be just wrong. This is also a fun part because the stakes are low. I used to, you can see in some of the older designs, I would bring the planet edge to here a lot, but then I realized I would there would be an extra step where I would paint the black on and I would have to sponge it away from this edge. And then I'd have to take the brush and go like this, and get it just on that spot. And if it like if it went a little bit over, then I would have to wipe it all down and start over. So just having the planet go all the way around the bottom, like cut out a whole step, saves a bunch of time. I want to time myself to see exactly how much time it's saving, but I think that'll just stress me out for how much time I was wasting beforehand. Like sometimes you look back at an old process and you're like, what was I thinking? More often than not, just that I wasn't. But it'll be nice, you know, if I come in on a Saturday, I can come in and like work on a few pieces and just really pay attention to what I'm doing in a way that I don't get to during the week. I think the thing that I worry the most about is that I've invested a lot of time and effort in building a system that is categorically inefficient and that I need to completely dismantle it and put it back together if it's going to be better. Like I can't build on what I have. I need to tear it down and, and start over. And there are parts of my process where that is abundantly clear. Um, there are things that I, I just need to completely dismantle and, and rebuild and I know how to do it and I know what I need to do, but it's gonna be such an upheaval that I just can't find the right opportunity to do that. So then we get to come back and wipe the glaze off of the foot. But so I carve like a little undercut here and, and a little ledge there. So we can just like press the sponge on and turn and it comes off in a nice clean line. I'm just proud of myself because I, this wasn't a response to seeing someone else do it. This was a response to it being a pain in the butt in my own work. So I'm, I'm always very proud of the things that I feel like I figure out kind of on my own. The whole process is informed entirely by issues that I've run into in the past. Because when you're dealing with other people, communication is incredibly important. And that wasn't always a priority for me. They would send me a picture of their dog, I would make the pot, I would send them the pot. Now it's much more collaborative. They'll send photos of the dog. If those photos don't work for what I need, I am comfortable now saying like, I need more, you need to send me more. Before I would just try and make do, and that never works. So this is the point where I would send photos of this design to customers and ask, you know, what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Is there anything you need to change? And that all came about because I made this cup and uh, never sent any photos of it to the customer until it was done. And then I sent a photo, oh man, I totally missed the mark on that. Um, I sent a photo of it, you know, when it was done and the person was like, I love it, but my dog is missing their right ear. And in the drawing, the dog had both ears. And she was like, is there any way you can like edit an ear out? And I was like, no, but I will remake it. So now I send photos at this stage to make sure that the dogs all have the appropriate numbers of ears. Um, and with teapots, they're unique. Generally speaking, I'll paint the black outside next. But with teapots, because glazing the inside is more difficult because it's got the spout and the, the like mouth, I'll do that now. So that if stuff dribbles on it, I can just wipe it away and I'm not really losing anything. So we'll take one of these guys, stir it up, pour it in. I'm gonna get a bunch in there. And then I don't know if you can see in there, oh, there's a little pigeon on the side of the wall. Pigeon's like a little nugget of clay, we'll let it be. So then we're gonna pour it up, or like kind of get it up to there, bring it all the way around. And then we're gonna come back to the other side, kind of approaching the spout. So we keep our thumb on the spout so we don't pour a bunch of glaze all over the table. But we want to glaze the whole inside of the spout. So we're going to let that fill up. Make sure we got good, even coverage, and then we can pour it out. Oh, so I'm trying to pour it out of the spout because this I got to clean now, but yeah. 
doesn't always go to plan. I always wanted to go to art school. That was a fight that I had with my parents a lot. There was a lot of skepticism on like, okay, if you get a degree in illustration, like what comes next, you know? Uh, so the, the agreement that we came up with was that I could apply to state schools and private colleges that had art programs and minor in art and major in, in something more traditional, maybe. And I could apply to one art school. That was the rule, was that I could apply to one art school that was kind of the reach. So I ended up applying to RISD, fully expecting to not get in. You know, it, was, it was kind of a, the Hail Mary. Uh, and the, the agreement was that if I got in, I would go. Um, so I got in, and then I went. The more exposure that my parents had to the, like that community, the more they began to realize that everything is art to a degree. When I first visited RISD and like the, the tour, these kids in this class were making clay ocarinas, and they were testing them while they were making them to make sure that they had like the, the proper shape to make noise. And we like walked into this classroom and all these kids had clay all over their mouths. <laughs> it's like college students with this just clay all around their mouth. And my parents were like, what is going on here? But now I totally get that because so now there's a bunch of glaze in here. And if we let it, it might pool and clog the inside. So we got to blow it back out. I mean, it would glaze in my mouth. Pleh. Pleh. What's it taste like? Dirt. I think the most time consuming part is painting the black on the outside, but it's also my favorite part because it's very meditative. I don't really have to think very hard. <laughs> Which, I don't know, that's kind of a through line in a lot. I just, I want to, you know, zone out. Like going through the process. This is getting low. But a lot of this is just like how you hold it. We'll kind of scrub the glaze on instead of brushing it until it's along the edge that we want, and then we brush it away. I'm also very impatient, and the thing that I love about glazing pots is that it dries so quickly. Uh, that you can like, you don't have to be very careful about what you've just painted. Every now and then, so I, I'm using this brush because why not? But it's not the one that I normally use. And I have all these brushes. I hate this brush. I don't know why I keep it. I never use it. It's always this one and that one. These two. I just like, and that's the white brush, you know? You're talking about if I have like things that, you know, like special objects. This is so this is the white brush and if I lose this brush or when the bristles like finally fall out of it I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know where it came from. I can use another brush But you I get you get so accustomed to them This one's got this like weird bend in it and it's because, it's because I spray-painted it and left it out in the Sun and it warped and now I love it Glazing this from start to finish normally I don't do that you know I'll, I'll do the black on this and then I'll do the black on everything else yeah. But I, I did one teapot start to finish last week, uh, and it took me like three hours. I was just like, oh, God. Because, you know, when you, when you break it into small pieces and, and do it alongside everything else, it's really easy to lose sight of how much time goes into something. I traded a long time ago with an artist a mug with her cat on it for this tiny little ceramic coyote. It's the cutest little object, and it... it it's something that I can like kind of ground to. Like if I'm feeling stressed, I can just focus on like this thing that doesn't change. An, an unintended side effect of using these is that this muscle now is like really strong from just holding that position all day. And I used to get the worst hand cramps. because you have to keep a little bit of pressure on it to keep it flowing, but too much and it'll like kind of explode. But this is probably the second most time consuming part behind painting in the black backgrounds. 
So like that, yeah, that kind of thing, it, it's not the end of the world. I'll just let it dry. This is like very empty. I think that's why that's happening. Um, I'll just let it dry and scrape it with a, a dental tool. That's like the two things that you will see in pretty much every pottery studio is something from a kitchen store and something that looks like it could be a dental tool. It's like, we'll take this guy. I'm pretty sure that this is from a dentist's office and we can just like scoop that right there. Just pick that right up. And if I'm feeling unsure about how much of the black I've taken off, I can go back before I do the next step, just paint a little more in there. But I mean, this is like, it's all pretty forgiving. The very last step is to just do all the stars. I used to consider like a cluster here and then space it out a little bit. And then I was very intentional about where I placed them. Uh, but now I just kind of feel my way through it. It was good to do at the time because it, it helped the design. Otherwise, you know, if, if all the stars are evenly spaced, they feel kind of static. And I like bunch them back up. The thing that would always happen was I would get really focused right around the figures that I was drawing. So there would always be a big cluster of stars like right on top of the dog. And then it would spread out when it got further away. And then, you know, you can come back here and like where that, that dot was before that kind of like spread out from the leg, you can just like kind of pile a bunch of stars in there and hide that mistake too. If something goes wrong, you're like, all right, well, now I need to figure out like when I'm going to fix that. But with these, I've been doing this, des I've been making this design for so long that all of the mistakes that I have, all, I think all of the mistakes that I can make, I have made, or at least the big ones. So I have, you know, workarounds built in. Like this guy keeps getting jammed. Typically, I mean, I kind of forgot because I got carried away. Typically, I'll do the inside of the handle first just so that I can like really hold any part of the mug when I do it. On a handful of pots for a show years ago, I forgot to do all of the insides of the handles. And uh, I was like, oh God, I'm sunk, I'm ruined. You know, no one will ever buy these and nobody noticed. There's just something comfortable about repetition when I was in school, people would say, you know, if you want to be a production potter, you have to be comfortable making the same thing over and over again as a, a deterrent, you know? Like, it's going to get boring. But I really quickly discovered that I loved perfecting a technique, like doing the same thing over and over again, making the same shape over and over again, and, and refining it a little bit each time is the opposite of tedious for me. I think it's, like, fascinating. There's so much I can't control. That's part of what I like about it too is that you kind of have to work with the material because it's always working against you. That when you build a routine around it, it's, it's just very satisfying. But what I'm looking for, if you like look at the side of these, it's a nice straight line with a little curve at the bottom. And what I saw in the bowl that was on the wheel was it was starting to curve up high because it was slumping. And that's because I did the thing that I said that all my students do, which was I tried to pull the walls and shape them at the same time. So this time we're going to pull the walls straight up and then lower them down. Make sure all those little creases on the bottom are gone. And then round it. Back to the wheel. There's like a million words for it, and everyone has their own favorite. I like Potter, you know. People, like, they know what pottery is. They've seen Ghost. They have a very romanticized image of what it is in their mind. Unless someone knows someone who does it, it does, it's a hobby. That's how most people contextualize pottery. But I used to get like snarky about it, you know? Cause it's like, yeah, it's yes, yes, it is my real job. So it's a lot of disappointing answers to questions that they have. Cause they're like, oh, do you like throw every day? I'm like, no, like not even every week. In a given month, I will probably sit at the potter's wheel and like actually throw pottery for maybe five days. The lion's share of my job is selling it, not making it. And I didn't become a potter because I love selling pottery. The sound of industry.
All right, so we're gonna go straight up and then lower the walls into position. So it's starting to expand. That's because we've got the wheel going a little too fast, so we're gonna collar it back in. Keep those walls moving up. To slow that wheel down. But that means that the pole has to slow down too. And then we're gonna leave a ton of clay up at the rim so it's nice and thick so we can get that carved edge in there. It also helps to keep things from warping. So I'm gonna do one last pull just to make sure there's no thick spots. And this one we're gonna start to shape because after this we're gonna go right into shaping this bowl. And we're gonna do it the proper way. I tried to shortcut it last time. I saw what happened. Every now and then I think I'm too good for my own rules. Okay, so instead of trying to shape it with that wood knife, we're gonna use the rib this time. We're gonna shape it from the inside. Fold it down. Yeah, so I mean that's Nah, it's still a little trumpety. It drives me crazy. It's not what I want. I think it's just that, yeah, it's, it, it comes back to like, it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not what I expect. It's not what I, not what I plan. And, and if it's not exactly what I'm planning for it to be, then I don't like it. Okay, here's the part that I like, killed all the ones that I did before. So we're gonna use the corner of this and just slowly try and carve that ridge. A little bit at a time. Easy peasy. You can just iron that out. Now we're just fussing. Yeah. All right. Still got it. And that's a serving bowl. I think a lot of people put a lot of pressure on themselves to hit a home run every time they're at bat, and it's impossible to do that in ceramics. You can do everything right, and something might not come out the way you want it to for you know an infinite number of reasons. So a lot of it is accepting that you don't have complete control over this material. With that slip. I have this one guy that every year he places an order for a set of something. I think he enjoys the process of having a vision and then pitching it to me and then we go back and forth and I can bring that into reality. And he's always incredibly understanding. Um, he's like the dream client. This is the, the guy that sends the like, you know, pages and pages of custom details. So we got a bunch of all the family dogs around. That's this one. Oh, this is a fun one. This is like an otter. Oh no, uh, a ferret. I'm finally actually now properly doing weasels. Um, <laughs> I don't remember which one this is. Uh, we're just gonna put them over here. We'll sort it out later. So these are the custom orders from, this is more of the guy who like sends pages and pages of notes. So he wanted like really specific, like close up portraits of all of his siblings' dogs. And the stacking was a happy accident. I never really planned on it and then I noticed that they did and I leaned into it. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, so then I'll, I'll photograph all of these and um, send photos of of all the pieces to the customer and, and if they sign off on it, it gets shipped. Hope he likes it. But yeah, that's, that's, that's the whole, that's start to finish. I think this lizard's my favorite from this batch. It's just like the little like, yeah. the tail.
I like to make objects that people can enjoy without having to consider how awful everything can be. Nobody needs what I'm making, but if it's something that makes you smile at all, then it's kind of worth keeping around. I've met some chickens that I've liked. A friend of mine raised chickens in Maine. They're cute. They're like little dinosaurs. 